We're going to talk here about some of the disorders of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. Now this might have been uh, something that you discarded after the first year of medical school because you might have thought that biochemistry is really complex and not very high yield for clinical practice. And the fact is that while you can always memorize the symptoms of any disorder and discard the underlying pathophysiology, personally, I think that understanding the underlying pathophysiology of a disorder makes it a lot easier to understand and remember the symptoms that arise. And if you understand these pathophysiologic processes, which of course requires that you understand normal physiology, it's going to make it so much easier to uh, understand these disorders. And so I want to briefly talk about the normal process of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis and then talk about a couple of the major disorders that come from uh, disturbances of these processes. So what we're going to do here is we're going to review the process of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, and then we're going to talk about two disorders, uh, one of glycolysis and one of gluconeogenesis. And then uh, we'll finish at that point, and then if you want to stick around, uh, we'll talk about four other disorders uh, a little bit more briefly. Uh, but uh, I want to first talk about these two big ones because they do come up on the test and they come up with relative frequency in clinical practice, although uh, von Gierke's disease is a little bit more rare. Uh, but it is commonly tested, so uh, you want to be aware of this. Okay, so we'll talk about these two disorders and then we'll talk about the, the other four uh, later, but if you want to you know, stop watching because these other four are a, a lot rarer, you can feel free to do so. Okay, so this is the process of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis as it relates to sort of our roadmap of, path of, uh, of physiologic processes that happen in the body uh, within the cells. And for glycolysis, the major substrate is glucose. That's what we're starting with. And the goal is pyruvate. Okay, so glucose to pyruvate. Now, as you can see, there's various ways you can enter the glycolysis chain, you can enter with fructose, you can enter with glycerol, and you'll come in at various points along the way of glycolysis. But the major substrate is glucose, glucose to pyruvate. Now when we're doing gluconeogenesis, there's various ways that we can uh, enter the process. Uh, so essentially what we're doing here though with gluconeogenesis is we're working backwards. We're going from something to glucose. And the whole goal of gluconeogenesis, whereas the goal for glycolysis is to make energy out of glucose or another substrate, the goal of glycolysis is strictly to make glucose. Okay, so here's another picture of the glycolysis and gluconeogenesis pathways. As you can see, a lot of these enzymes are the same from one to the next. Okay, so we're just working backwards when we do gluconeogenesis. The ones you'll want to be familiar with, especially if you're taking step one, are any of these enzymes that are different from one side to the next. So hexokinase and glucose 6, -phosphate, uh, 6 phosphatase, uh, phosphofructokinase and fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase. Uh, and then going down here uh, to pyruvate kinase and pyruvate carboxylase and PEP carboxykinase. So those will be the ones that you'll want to be familiar with uh, when uh, if you're going to be taking step one. Uh, step two and three, you definitely really don't need to be uh, familiar with the enzymes themselves. Okay, so when we do glycolysis, remember that we are actually when we start out, we're consuming ATP. Remember, the goal of glycolysis is to make energy. As we start out, we're consuming ATP. It makes sense because we have to add these phosphate groups. So you consume ATP in this step from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, and then you consume ATP from this step, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. At that point, you split the 6-carbon sugar into two three-carbon sugars, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP, and glyceraldehyde three phosphate. And then that dihydroxyacetone phosphate can get converted into glyceraldehyde three phosphate through this enzyme here. And it's only glyceraldehyde three phosphate that can continue down the chain of glycolysis. You can't convert dihydroxyacetone phosphate to something else uh, 
that goes directly into glycolysis, only to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And there's a disorder that uh, we'll talk about towards the end that interferes with this ability to convert dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Uh, then what happens is that you have two equivalents of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. The glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate that you made out of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and then the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate that was converted from the DHAP. Uh, so because you have two equivalents, every time that you make an ATP, you're really making two ATPs. And so you'll make an ATP in this dephosphorylation when you go from 1,2-BPG to 3-phosphoglycerate, and then you'll make another ATP as you go from phosphoenopyruvate, which has one phosphate group, uh, to pyruvate. So you'll make two ATPs at both of those steps because you have two equivalents. So from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to pyruvate, you actually make four ATPs per glucose, whereas you're consuming two ATPs per glucose from glucose to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So the net out of glycolysis is that you make two ATPs. Okay. Now there's something else that happens here. And that is when we go from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,2-bisphosphoglycerate, we need something that can be reduced, okay, because we're oxidizing glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And what we use is a molecule called NAD. You may remember this. So NAD is going to accept an electron from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and it's going to make NADH. And NADH can be useful to us. We can take NADH and we can put it into oxidative phosphorylation in which that electron is then transferred down a chain and it's accepted by oxygen and that makes a lot of ATP. However, it requires oxygen and let's say you're being chased by a bear in the forest and you need to run as fast as you can. You're not going to have a lot of oxygen. You're going to be doing a lot of activity and you need a lot of ATP, but you're not going to have any oxygen, and so all of your ATP is going to come through glycolysis. Uh, because you don't have any oxygen, NADH will accumulate, but you need NAD to continue glycolysis, and so you need some way of regenerating NAD. And what we wind up doing is we take that NADH, we give the electron to pyruvate, and then pyruvate is converted into lactate. And we can then regenerate our NAD and continue this pathway. Unfortunately, the pathway of making lactate, uh, it's this lactate is, it, it can't just sit around. It's got to be detoxified because if lactate gets into your bloodstream, which it does, you get lactic acidosis. It drops the pH of your blood, and you can ultimately die from that. And so we need to be able to get rid of that lactate, and we'll talk about how that happens. So let's say that you eat a meal, like I just did for breakfast. I had a donut this morning, full of sugar, probably shouldn't have ate it. Uh, but you make, uh, you're bringing in glucose into your blood, absorbing it from your gut. What hormone does your body synthesize to bring insulin in from your blood? And you should know that that, insulin, or that hormone is insulin. So insulin does two really important things. Insulin is going to help you bring glucose in from your blood. Uh, and then it's also going to upregulate the enzymes that drive glycolysis. Okay, so the goal of insulin is to bring glucose in from the blood and then to take that glucose and use it in the cell. So you can, one of the ways you can use it is through glycolysis. You can take glucose and make pyruvate. Another way that you can use glucose is by storing it as glycogen, and we'll talk about that briefly in a little bit. Uh, we're not going to talk about uh, glycogen too much here, though. Okay, now on the other hand, let's say that you're fasting. You go the day without eating. Let's say you have a, a long sh shift at work. You don't get to eat that much. What's your body's main purpose? Out of all of metabolism, what's the most important thing, arguably? Well, if you're not eating, you, your body needs a way of keeping your blood glucose level somewhat normal, right? You don't want your blood glucose level to drop and drop and drop to zero if you're not eating because you die. Your body needs a way of keeping your blood glucose somewhere between that 60 and 100 milligram per deciliter range. And your body does this by synthesizing a hormone. What is that hormone? It is glucagon. And glucagon will downregulate these enzymes that, uh, that are responsible for glycolysis because if we need 
sugar in our blood, we don't want to be using sugar in our cells. So it will downregulate hexokinase, it will downregulate PFK, and it will downregulate pyruvate kinase. On the other hand, it will upregulate these enzymes that are responsible for, uh, for turning things into glucose. Okay, it'll also up or downregulate the enzymes that are used for glycogen storage because we don't want to be storing glucose <clears throat> when we need glucose in the blood. Okay, so glucagon helps us get glucose, uh, make glucose and get it out into the blood. And that's important because, like I said, we want to keep our blood glucose level uh, relatively normal uh, when we're uh, not eating. Okay. So remember that when we are making ATP, if we don't have oxygen, then one of the ways that we, or really the only way that we regenerate NAD, which we need for glycolysis, is that we convert it into lactate. We convert pyruvate into lactate. And that lactate gets out into the blood, and we need a way to get rid of that lactate because otherwise our blood pH would drop and we'd die. And the way that we do that, one of the ways that we do that is by detoxifying lactate, or getting rid of lactate in the liver. Now you can get rid of it through the kidneys, but that's not really good enough. Okay, we need to do this in the liver. And so that lactate goes into the liver, and then it gets converted to glucose, and the pathway that we use is gluconeogenesis. All right. So what is one of the drugs that are commonly is commonly prescribed that, uh, that will interfere with this gluconeogenesis pathway. I'll give you a hint, you use it a lot in the US if you ever deal with diabetics. That drug is known as metformin. And metformin works by inhibiting gluconeogenesis. Now if you have a diabetic and you want to lower the glucose, the overall glucose levels, then metformin is actually pretty useful because you're inhibiting gluconeogenesis, so you make less glucose. And on the on, on the surface of it, that sounds really good because we have less glucose in a diabetic. That's good, right? But the problem with that is that one of the ways that we use gluconeogenesis is we use it to get rid of lactate. And it's not necessarily, your liver is not necessarily trying to make glucose here as much as it's trying to get rid of lactate. And if this gluconeogenesis pathway is inhibited, then one of the problems that comes from that is that lactate is going to sit around in the blood. And that is one of the major adverse effects. The big black box warning on metformin is that you can develop lactic acidosis. And so now you understand why that happens. You'll also understand why in people with liver disease, for instance, or people with kidney disease, we want to avoid metformin because this process is already uh, is already problematic. If you have liver disease, you're already going to have a hard time getting lactate to uh, be converted back to glucose. If you have kidney disease, your kidneys are going to have a hard time of getting rid of lactate, and that's going to be uh, there's going to be more demand on the kidneys to get rid of lactate when you're taking metformin. Also, if you're an alcoholic. Uh, metformin is probably not the best. Why? Because if you're an alcoholic, uh, you're going to have reduced stores of NAD. If you have reduced stores of NAD, you're going to be making more lactate. Okay. All right, so we're going to talk about pyruvate kinase here first, pyruvate kinase deficiency. Now, pyruvate kinase is one of those enzymes that are necessary to get glucose to pyruvate. It's the very, very last step. And pyruvate kinase converts uh, the phosphoenopyruvate to pyruvate, and in doing so, it makes an ATP. Now, for most of our cells, we don't really rely on glycolysis too much. Um, it's, it's useful for, you know, for our muscles. It's useful, you know, for, for, quick, for, for a quick synthesis of ATP. But our cells don't really strictly rely on glycolysis to make energy. There's other ways we can make energy, uh, namely through oxidative phosphorylation. However, there's one cell that can't do oxidative phosphorylation. What cell would that be? I'll give you a hint. Oxidative phosphorylation requires a mitochondria. And that would be your red blood cell. Your red blood cell is entirely dependent on glycolysis to make energy. So if you take out pyruvate kinase, and uh, here we go. So you take out pyruvate kinase right here, 
you can make ATP all the way from glucose to phosphoenopyruvate. But if you look here, from glucose to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, you're consuming 2-ATP, and then from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to phosphoenopyruvate, you're making 2-ATP. The result of that is that you don't really make any ATP because you're consuming 2 and making 2. And this is a big problem for your red blood cells because they don't have mitochondria. They can't really make any ATP effectively. Okay, so uh, the main site of pathology is going to be the erythrocyte, which is completely dependent on glycolysis to make ATP. And now you might think, well, our red blood cells, they don't, they're not really energy powerhouses. Why do we need them to make ATP? And it, the fact is, you don't. As for, for your own energy, uh, for your own body's store of ATP, you don't really rely on your red blood cells. But your red blood cells themselves, they need ATP to maintain cellular integrity. If you remember back to cellular biology, there is a channel known as a sodium-potassium ATPase, and that exists on the surface of red blood cells. And what it does is it maintains the cellular uh, concentration of potassium, because otherwise potassium would just efflux out of the cell, and you would wind up with a, a hypotonic cytosol. And that's, in fact, what happens in patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency. Sodium potassium ATPase doesn't work because they don't have ATP. And potassium is going, to, uh, is going to trickle out of the cell. It's going to bring water with it, and the cell is going to shrivel up and die. Okay, so these cells, they just shrivel up, and uh, ultimately they're going to have a shorter lifespan. They can work a little bit because they have hemoglobin, and they can, they can work a little bit, uh, but ultimately they will lyse. Uh, or they will uh, be taken up by the, by the uh, spleen because the spleen is going to see these deformed red blood cells and it's going to yank them out of the circulation and then it will destroy them. Okay, so these patients have a hemolytic anemia because the red blood cells themselves are lysing or they're being destroyed by the spleen uh, because they're defective. So this is a hemolytic anemia, and pyruvate kinase deficiency is the second most common cause of enzyme-deficient hemolytic anemia. What's the most common cause of enzyme-deficient hemolytic anemia? It's glucose 6-phosphate, uh, sorry, glucose 6-phosphatase deficiency, G6PD deficiency. And that has to do with a different enzyme, uh, and it's a little bit different because those patients... Uh, the mechanism is, is, uh, is due to the fact that they can't undergo uh, oxidative stress, uh, and the mechanism is quite different. Uh, for these patients, they're going to have constant symptoms because their problem is they can't make ATP. Uh, and so the, that's going to be constant because you, you always need ATP. The red blood cells always need ATP. Whereas for G6PD deficiency, they can't endure oxidative stress, but there's time, there's ways that you can avoid oxidative stress. Uh, so it's a little bit different with G6PD deficiency. Pyruvate kinase deficiency, the symptoms can be a lot more severe. Uh, so how do these patients present? Well, of course, they have anemia. So they're going to be fatigued. They're going to be short of breath. Pyruvate kinase deficiency often presents in children, and so since they're chronically anemic, they're going to have failure to thrive and growth delay. Remember that they have hemolytic anemia. So because they have hemolytic anemia, uh, they're going to be jaundiced and uh, possibly have scleral icterus. Why do they get that with hemolytic anemia? Remember that when these cells are destroyed, hemoglobin is spilled out into the, into the this, uh, bloodstream, and that hemoglobin is going to get metabolized into bilirubin, and that bilirubin then can get into tissue and cause it to look yellow. So jaundice and scleral icterus. Splenomegaly. Why do you get splenomegaly? Remember that that spleen is going to see these deformed erythrocytes. It's going to say, hey, you don't look quite right. I'm going to take you out of the bloodstream. And it's going to hold those, those deformed red blood cells as it destroys them. And that's going to cause the spleen to get big. So splenomegaly can happen. They can get right upper quadrant pain from cholestasis. They can also get signs of extramedullary hematopoiesis because they're their marrow is making more uh, red blood cells. And one of the places you can see this is in the forehead, on the frontal bone. Uh, it can get enlarged, and that uh, is due to 
extramedullary hematopoiesis. They're making red blood cells in places where they normally wouldn't. So the workup is going to be to get a CBC with differential. And any time you see a tired yellow person, you want to think about the possibility of hemolytic anemia. Okay, so tired yellow person, work them up for hemolytic anemia. CBC with differential, uh, you want to look at the reticula sites because any patient who's anemic, we want to make sure that their marrow is responding properly to make sure that they're, they're not having something like an aplastic anemia. And that also helps by getting the CBC because you can look at their white count and platelet count. Direct Coombs test, looking for an autoimmune uh, origin to the hemolytic anemia. Pi-linked antigen, looking for a possibility of PNH. And osmotic fragility, looking for possibly spherocytosis. And you'll get a smear with your CBC as well. Uh, and we'll see uh, what you'll get when you have pyruvate kinase deficiency. You get your uh, basic metabolic panel and then liver function tests looking for that bilirubin. Okay. So when you get your smear, actually, you'll be able to see some differences with these, uh, with these uh, red blood cells. Uh, so what you see here are these little indentations on the red blood cell and what this is is it's the cell kind of collapsing because it has a hypotonic uh, has a hypotonic cytosol and so what's going on is that you have hypertonic medium hypotonic cytosol and so you have an osmotic pressure inward and that's causing these little indentations the cell is basically shriveling up okay, and we call these echinocytes all right so this is our pathway. I think I talked about everything I wanted to talk about here. So management for pyruvate kinase deficiency. There's nothing we can do. We can't replace this enzyme. And there's nothing you can really avoid in pyruvate kinase deficiency. Unlike with G6PD deficiency, you can avoid oxidative stress. Uh, you can take things that, are, uh, that will help you with oxidative stress, things like uh, uh, an antioxidants. Uh, but with pyruvate kinase deficiency, there's really nothing you can do to, uh, not a whole lot you can do to, to remedy the situation. So it's mostly supportive care. Why do we give them folate and B12 supplements? Remember what I said about you have an anemia, so your bone marrow is responding by making red blood cells. What you're going to have here is kind of an a, a unfortunate cycle. So you're making red blood cells. Those red blood cells are then going to be defected because they don't have enough ATP. They're going to shrivel up. They're going to get taken off by the spleen, uh, and this, uh, or they'll they'll just lice in the circulation, and then you won't have red blood cells. And then you'll become anemic. Your kidney is going to make uh, is going to make erythropoietin. That erythropoietin is going to go to your bone marrow and say make more red blood cells. Uh, you make more red blood cells. Those red blood cells go into the circulation and the whole cycle starts up again. So what's basically happening is you're churning out red blood cells at a, at a relatively high rate. And what I do want to draw your attention to here is that when you get your CBC, uh, you should wind up seeing a, uh, an elevated reticulocyte count. And those re reticulocytes, what are they? What are reticulocytes? Reticulocytes are just immature red blood cells. They're, they're cells that get into the circulation, they'll be red blood cells within about a day. Uh, so you should see elevated red blood cells. It should be over 3%. Uh, so, sorry, elevated reticulocytes. It should be over 3%. Okay, so supportive care. Folate and B12 are useful because you're just churning out all these cells. Folate and B12 are being consumed, and so these patients are going to have uh, a, a susceptibility to be folate and B12 deficient. They shouldn't be folate and B12 deficient, but they have a susceptibility to become folate and B12 deficient because they're making all these new red blood cells uh, at such a high rate. Uh, red blood cell transfusions might be necessary in times of increased physiologic stress. So most patients with pyruvate kinase deficiency, uh, it'll only be mild, and so they may only develop symptoms in times of physiologic stress, like illnesses, infections, pregnancy, surgery. Uh, however, some may have constant symptoms and then when they get these physiologic stressors, they become very anemic and may need red blood cell transfusion. So there's varying levels of pyruvate kinase deficiency. Uh, you want to avoid salicylates 
Uh, why? Because salicylates are uncoupling agents, so they're going to reduce your ability to make ATP. And when you have a patient that already is having a hard time making ATP, why would you want to make it more difficult? Um, and then uh, very severe cases, you can do splenectomy. We want to avoid this because your spleen is useful for your immune function. But the thought behind splenectomy in very severe cases is that remember that those red blood cells, you go back to these echinocytes, they can kind of function. Okay, They do have hemoglobin. They can deliver oxygen. They're just a little deformed. They're not working as well as they should. However, uh, your spleen is going to see these cells and it's going it's to take them out. And so that's uh, another reason why you're getting anemia. So the thought is with spl splenectomy, if we take out the spleen, these echinocytes can at least stick around in, in the bloodstream a little longer. Despite the fact that they have a shortened life, they can stick around a little longer and that may improve the anemia. So that's why we do splenectomy in some patients. But the trade-off to that is that uh, splenectomy is going to increase your risk of, of infection, particularly from things like pneumococci. Okay, so I, I'm not sure, I didn't bring this up here, uh, but when you get your work up, what, what's your CBC going to look like? You're going to be anemic. You're going to have low hemoglobin, low hematocrit. White blood cell count, platelet count will be normal, uh, but your reticulocyte count should be high. Direct Coombs, pylink antigen, osmotic fragility should all be negative because those are all pointing towards other diseases. BMP should be normal. Liver function tests will probably show an increase in direct bilirubin. Okay. So this is what we do for pyruvate kinase deficiency. Okay. All right, we'll talk about those other disorders of glycolysis in a little bit. Okay, now the other disorder I want to talk about is gluconeogenesis. So remember, with gluconeogenesis, one of the important functions, aside from making glucose when you're fasting, is detoxifying lactic acid, lactate, in your liver and preventing yourself from going into lactic acidosis. You're going to see that any disorder of gluconeogenesis, one of the major, major effects of a disorder of gluconeogenesis is lactic acidosis. That's going to be a symptom, a, a sequelae of all the disorders of gluconeogenesis. And one we're going to talk about is von Gierke's disease, and it also happens to be a glycogen storage disorder, which I'll explain what that is and why that happens. So von Gierke's disease is a deficiency of the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase, and that catalyzes the conversion of glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. And that's the final step of gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. Okay, so if you look back here, this is where we have the problem, going from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. And look at all of the things that go on in metabolism. So whether you're taking fatty acids and putting it into, glyco uh, into the, the glycolysis gluconeogenesis chain, whether you're taking oxaloacetate and putting it into the gluconeogenesis chain, whether you're taking uh, things from the hexose monophosphate shunt and putting it towards uh, the gluconeogenesis chain, everything is going to rely on your ability to, or if, uh, more importantly, if you're taking glycogen and putting it into the gluconeogenesis chain, Everything is going to rely on your ability to change glucose 6-phosphate into glucose. That's the final step. And if you can't do that, then your body only has one way of getting glucose into your bloodstream, since you can't do gluconeogenesis. Your body's only way of getting glucose into your bloodstream is through the diet. And what happens at night when you go to sleep? Are you eating? No, you're not eating. And your body's only way of bringing glucose into your bloodstream is through gluconeogenesis. And so these patients are going to have a severe fasting hypoglycemia. They're going to get hypoglycemic episodes at night because once, that, once you have no more glucose in your gut to absorb, their glucose levels are going to drop and drop and drop and drop to, to, to very, very low levels. Another thing is that von Gierke's disease is a glycogen storage disorder. Why is it a glycogen storage disorder? Because they can't do anything with the glycogen that they have. They can make glycogen. They have no problem going from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate to glucose 1-phosphate and making glycogen. What they can't do is use that glycogen. They can't take the glycogen and break it down uh, 
to glucose. They can take the glycogen and break it all the way down to glucose 6-phosphate, but they can't do the final step to make glucose. So that glycogen is ultimately going to, uh, is going to accumulate because you have excess glucose 6-phosphate and uh, the glycogen will accumulate because you're not doing anything uh, with what you get from the glycogen. Okay, so you, you essentially have a metabolic block here. And so the glycogen will accumulate. All right, so with von Gierke's disease, one of the uh, one of the things that you can see from von Gierke's is a big liver. Why do you have a big liver? Well, liver is a place where you store glycogen, lots of glycogen in the liver. And so if you're storing all this excess glycogen, the liver is going to get big. Glucose 6-phosphatase also exists in the kidney, so you can get renomegaly, a little extra glycogen in the kidneys, and that's, that can be a problem not because the kidney gets big, but because that can actually damage the kidney. You can get uh, renal tubule damage, and ultimately from that you get chronic kidney disease, uh, Fanconi-like syndrome. And then you also have a little bit of, glu of glucose 6-phosphatase in the bowel. And that really isn't terribly important, but I'll explain one of the symptoms that can show up that is attributed to that. So the presentation, these patients tend to have this doll-like facies. It has nothing to do with glucose, I don't think. Uh, what it has to do probably is with the genetic defect. Hepatomegaly and renomegaly, as we already talked about. But how are these patients going to show up to you in the ER? And if you do see one of these patients, it's probably going to be in the ER. What happens? What's, what's the most important, the most worrisome symptom out of von Gierke's manifestation? It's going to be hypoglycemia. And what does hypoglycemia cause? It causes nausea and weakness because you don't have any energy. And then it also causes seizures, uh, hypoglycemic seizures. Remember that your brain needs glucose to fun function. And so at night, if you're not eating, your glucose levels drop you can get seizures, and these patients often present with recurrent hypoglycemic seizures. Chronically, they can get failure to thrive because they're chronically hypoglycemic because they're not making glucose. Uh, malabsorptive diarrhea, why? Because glucose 6-phosphatase can be in your diet, and that glucose 6-phosphatase cannot be absorbed because you can only absorb glucose. You can't absorb glucose 6-phosphate. Uh, so because glucose 6-phosphate is in your diet, you eat it, you can't break it down in von Gierke's because you don't have the appropriate enzyme, that glucose 6-phosphate is going to essentially act as an osmotic uh, force in your bowel and it's going to draw water out and you get diarrhea, malabsorptive diarrhea. Uh, joint pain, why do you get joint pain? This is interesting. Okay, so what do you have excess of in von Gierke's? you have excess lactate. Uh, because remember, gluconeogenesis, you need glucose 6-phosphatase. If you don't have glucose 6-phosphatase, you can't convert lactate into glucose. Lactate gets backed up, you can get lactic acidosis. Uh, and so you're gonna have excess lactate. Now remember, one of the ways that you can get rid of lactate is through, uh, is through your kidneys. And so if you're getting rid of extra lactate through your kidneys, that's fine. But there are two things that need to be delivered or uh, that need to be uh, taken out through your kidneys, and that's lactate and uric acid. And they compete for the same pathway to get out through your kidneys. And so if your body needs to get rid of extra, extra lactate because your liver can't do the job, then you're not going to be able to get rid of uric acid as easily because they compete for the same route out in the kidney. Uh, so you're going to actually get a uric acidosis. And that uric acid can form crystals in the joints and lead to uh, gout. And they can also form crystals in the kidney and lead to kidney stones. And then these patients can also get pancreatitis. Okay. So to work up von Gierke's, you'll get a finger stick glucose. Very, very, very important. Any patient whatsoever who has a seizure or is having a seizure, always get a glucose level, a finger stick glucose level. It's very easy and one of the reversible causes of seizures, be it from von Gierke's or from something else, is hypoglycemia. And if you can, if you can correct the hypoglycemia, you can cure the, the seizure just from that. Okay, so 
very important to get a finger stick glucose in any patient you suspect von Gierke's, but particularly any patient who's having a seizure. You get a CBC, you get a CMP, you get a lactic acid level, you get a urinalysis checking for kidney function. Uh, you also want to get a uric acid level too, and then a lipase. And what should you see? Of course, you're going to see a hypoglycemia, particularly when they're fasting. A CBC should be within normal limits. CMP can have a wide variety of disturbances depending on whether they have chronic kidney disease. Uh, lactic acid should be elevated. Uric acid is usually elevated. Urinalysis may show myoglobinuria. Why? Because it's a glycogen storage disease, and so you may have some breakdown of muscle. Lipase will occasionally be elevated. That's a sign of pancreatitis. Uh, the definitive test for von Gierke's is a glycogen storage disease panel. We don't just jump in and do biopsies for von Gierke's if we can avoid it because this genetic testing is a little bit easier. Okay, And the glycogen storage disease panel, really, uh, it tests for all the glycogen storage diseases, and there's a lot of them. You just order a glycogen storage disease panel if you think a patient has glycogen storage disease. And there's three different genes that can be defected in von Gierke's. The one you're going to see most commonly is G6PC uh, gene, and that's the von Gierke's 1A. And that's what we've been talking about is glycogen storage disease 1A. Uh, there's three subtypes of von Gierke's. The other two are 1B and 1C. 1C you're never going to see uh, because it's very rare. Uh, 1B is similar to 1A. The only difference is with 1B, uh, there's some defect in how the white blood cells can function, and so there will be a predilection for infections of the lung and skin. Okay, so there's an immunodeficiency component as well. Uh, but 1A is the one I want you to be most uh, familiar with. So to manage von Gierke's, you want to, of course, correct the hypoglycemia in acute cases. As for their diet, they are going to need to have glucose constantly. And so you want to avoid sugars that they can't use. They have no use for fructose. They have no use for sorbitol. They have no use for galactose. Why do they have no use for that? Because if you have fructose, if you have galactose, if you have sorbitol, which isn't shown here, ultimately, you're, it, it, for, for most of us, we can convert that into glucose. And the final step is glucose dysphosphate to glucose. But for them... They, don't, they can't do that step. They can't go from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. Uh, so fructose is going to be useless for them, and galactose is going to be use, useless for them as far as making glucose. They can take that and turn it into, at least they can take fructose and turn that into energy, uh, but they, as far as making glucose uh, and keeping them from going hypoglycemic, those sugars are totally useless for them. Okay? So... You want to avoid those sugars. Uh, as far as at night, they need to be able to have some kind of uh, relatively constant source of, of glucose to keep them from going hypoglycemic. So for infants, that can be difficult. You do nighttime nasogastric drip feeding has been recommended. For older children they're just and adults, they're going to need to wake up and have uh, a glucose source. And what you're going to use is you can use uncooked starch, and just dissolve it into water, and, which will dissolve it into its glucose components, and they need to take this day and night so they're getting adequate amounts of glucose. That means waking up in the middle of the night and having their, their starch, uh, because remember, if they don't have anything in their gut, they're not going to be able to uh, maintain a nor normal blood glucose level. <clears throat> you can consult hepatology and nephrology as needed. Complications that arise from von Gierke's, of course, the hypoglycemic seizures, they can get chronic kidney disease, and then hepatic adenoma, which itself is benign but has the potential to convert into a malignant uh, form, into uh, a malignant liver, uh, liver cancer. Okay, so this is a, uh, a pathology slide, a, a, a biopsy of the liver. Uh, from von Gierke's, you can see that these hepatocytes are not normal at all. So you see your little, uh, your little uh, hepatocytes, and they should be just pink, but you have this like ground glass material, and this really isn't anything inside of it. Uh, what it is is the places where the glycogen was, and you get excess glycogen buildup in, in von Gierke's. Okay, so these cells are not normal at all, and if you want to see what a normal, uh, normal liver looks like, you can 
Google that if you want. But this is excess glycogen in the cells, characteristic of von Gierke's disease. And you have to put it together with the clinical picture too. Okay, so let's go back and uh, if you want, you can stop watching here because now we're gonna talk about lower yield stuff. But if you, if you want to understand glycolysis and gluconeogenesis even better, let's talk about some of these other disorders. So first one is triose phosphate isomerase deficiency. So triose phosphate isomerase deficiency is a deficiency of triose phosphate isomerase. Makes sense, right? What is triose phosphate isomerase? Triose phosphate isomerase is that very important enzyme that converts dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and, and vice versa. But it, more important, it's the conversion of dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which is not very useful to us, uh, in converting it to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, which can continue down. Uh, it can continue down the glycolysis chain. You can't go from dihydroxyacetone phosphate to 1,3-phosphoglycerate. You can only go from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Uh, so you need to convert that dihydroxyacetone phosphate equivalent to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And it's the triose phosphate isomerase that does that. If you don't have triose phosphate isomerase, there's going to be two major problems. First of all, you only will develop one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate for every glucose. Okay, just the one that you directly make out of the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And so you're only going to have two total ATPs for every glucose generated. Okay, so you only generate two ATPs per glucose instead of four. And so ultimately what that means is that you make a net of zero. And as you know, if you're not making ATP, your red blood cells are going to have a problem with that. Also, what's problematic? Look at all these things that go into dihydroxyacetone phosphate. That's fine. That's fine because you take uh, fatty acid metabolism, turn it into dihydroxyacetone phosphate, then put that into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and you can do glycolysis with that. You take fructose, you make dihydroxyacetone phosphate, turn it into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, you do glycolysis with that. However, people who have a deficiency or an absence of triose phosphate isomerase, they're not going to be able to do that. The dihydroxyacetone phosphate is going to accumulate. That might be okay, but this DHAP is not a benign molecule. As a matter of fact, if it accumulates in high enough levels, it's neurotoxic. Okay, so one of the signs of triose phosphate isomerase deficiency is a hemolytic anemia for the exact same reasons as pyruvate kinase deficiency. Some other signs are consistent with the accumulation in DHAP, and that's chiefly going to be neurologic deficits. They can also get cardiomyopathy and immunodeficiency. And so the hemolytic anemia is because they're not making enough ATP in their red blood cells. The other three symptoms are from the accumulation of DHAP. This is a very rare disorder. Typically, it's going to result in death in infancy and early childhood. Okay, the other one is Tarui's disease. And Tarui's disease is also a glycogen storage uh, defect, and this is type 7, it's quite rare, uh, but this is a deficiency of phosphofructokinase, and that catalyzes the uh, irreversible reaction of uh, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now, why is this a glycogen storage disease? Oh, uh, shoot. Uh, I'm trying to get back over. Here we go. Okay. Why is this a glycogen storage disease? Because the block is here. Okay, the block is uh, where we would normally go from, uh, from fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And remember that when we're breaking down glycogen, apart from making glucose, one of the important things of breaking down glycogen is to make energy. Think about your muscles. What happens in your muscles when you are uh, exercising? Well, first you're going to use any of the glucose uh, sugars that are already there but then after a while, your muscles switch to glycogen. And it's that glycogen store that supplies more glucose. And for most of us, that works really well. But for these patients, because they can't take glycogen and make energy out of it, they're going to have a problem with, with making energy with sustained exercise because they need to take glycogen and convert it ultimately to pyruvate. Uh, so this is the problem with Tarui's disease. They're going to have exercise intolerance. And uh, what they can get out of that is cramping and vomiting. They can only exercise for a few minutes. 
they have to rest and replenish their the, the sugar levels in their muscle uh, and so it's exercise intolerance which is the problem for them they can also get rhabdomyolysis because of muscle breakdown they can also get anemia probably a little bit of a uh, uh, the, well the anemia could be from a variety of things but if you look at the pathway here uh, okay so if you look at the pathway if you have a if you have a block here, you're not going to be able to do glycolysis as well, and so that could affect the red blood cells. However, you, they do have one thing going for them. They could take fructose and make glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate. Uh, and so the uh, because they can do that, uh, they, they can do uh, glycolysis a little bit better than the people with pyruvate kinase deficiency, where the block is way down here, and that's going to be much more problematic for doing glycolysis. All right, so uh, we'll talk about some of these other disorders of gluconeogenesis. Let me get all the way back here. Okay, so fructose bisphosphatase deficiency is a deficiency of fructose bisphosphatase, which irreversibly catalyzes fructose 1,6 bisphosphate to fructose 6 bisphosphate, so essentially the reverse of Tarui's disease. And this is not a glycogen storage disease because they can use glycogen. So they have no problem going from glycogen to glucose, going from uh, glycogen down to pyruvate. Where they have a problem is with gluconeogenesis. They can't go from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. So this is the reverse of phosphofructokinase. And so because they have a problem with gluconeogenesis, one of their symptoms is going to be lactic acidosis. They're also going to have a fasting hypoglycemia because they can't make glucose properly. And that can be induced by fructose. Why is it induced by fructose? Because it's going to monkey around with these enzymes, which allosterically activate and inhibit each other. And so you want to avoid fructose because otherwise, and I'm not going to go into the complex reasons why, uh, because you're going to have a buildup of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and that, that can alter the activity of these enzymes, and that can uh, reduce... Uh, glucose production itself, apart from the fact that they have uh, an intrinsic defect in gluconeogenesis. Okay, so they're going to have a fasting hypoglycemia similar to von Gierke's, uh, and then they're also going to have a uh, they're also going to have a uh, a lactic acidosis issue, uh, and it can also their hypoglycemia can be induced by fructose. Okay, so that's fructose bisphosphatase deficiency. The difference from von Gierke's, what's the major difference? Okay, so the last disorder I wanted to talk about is pyruvate carboxylase deficiency. What is pyruvate carboxylase? It is an enzyme that we use to make phosphoenopyruvate out of oxaloacetate. Okay, so if you think about this, if you go from oxaloacetate to phosphoenopyruvate, you can take anything that goes into Krebs cycle and you can shunt it into gluconeogenesis. And that's really, really, really nice. If you don't have that, you have no way of doing gluconeogenesis from anything that comes into Krebs cycle. Okay, so these patients are going to have a problem with gluconeogenesis because they can't take things out of Krebs cycle and put it towards gluconeogenesis. So this interferes both with gluconeogenesis and Krebs cycle. So these patients can get a fasting hypoglycemia, a lactic acidosis, as we would suspect with anything that interferes with gluconeogenesis, but they can also get two other problems. They can get neurological defects. Why? Has nothing to do with gluconeogenesis or anything with energy metabolism. Has to do with the fact that pyruvate carboxylase is a necessary enzyme in making myelin. And so they're going to have white matter atrophy. They can also get hyperaminemia. So if you look at this pathway here, you can see that the urea cycle is responsible for getting rid of nitrogen, shunting it into things that can go into Krebs cycle, and then ultimately that can go into the gluconeogenesis pathway. If you have a blockage here, you're going to have uh, accumulation of all of these things here, which ultimately is going to lead to excess ammonia. So they get hyperaminemia out of this. Okay, so... Uh, this is, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis are just uh, two of the important pathways of metabolism. In the next section, we're going to talk about fructose and galactose metabolism, which yield some very, very important uh, disorders. So I will see you next time.
The major difference from Von Gierke's is that they can break down glycogen and put it into glucose. Okay, so they can form glucose from glycogen. Von Gierke's, the problem is right here, glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. Uh, with fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase deficiency, their problem is right here. So they can do uh, glycogen breakdown. So it's not a glycogen storage disease. But they're going to have difficulty in, uh, in they're, they're going to have difficulty in making glucose out of fructose or making glucose out of uh, pyruvate and lactate. So they will get the lactic acidosis um, and they will get the hypoglycemia. Uh, 